welcome to another episode of Why We Do What We Do. I'm your host, Abraham. And I am the co-host, Ryan O. And today we are going to talk about something uh, a little bit complicated, kind of technical. Uh, we're going to be talking about brain scans. Now, there are at least 10 different ways to slice a brain, if you will. Um, but we are uh, going to isolate specifically the fMRI today, or the Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging. Yeah. So that kind of starts us with... Uh, I guess we're emphasizing the brain in this, right? Yeah. So, so it can kind of start us off on some topics like that. Right, right, yeah. So you did a lot of background on the brain and so some uh, conceptual uh, ways to just think about the brain and its role in understanding behavior. Um, so this is not going to be specific to understanding exactly how the brain works or how a neuron works or regions of the brain, but just sort of thinking about what does the brain do, right? Yeah, exactly. So... There's a, like a huge fascination with the brain and its role that it plays. Um, and there was just a couple quick notes that I wanted to say. I don't want to take up too much time on this, really. Sure. Um, the first one is that uh, we're very brain-centric. Uh, I feel like there's a lot of just media, TV, radio. Uh, it's just kind of like ingrained in our culture of mm -hmm. like how important it is. Yeah. Um, and a I lot of times you hear people say like, my brain didn't let me remember this, you know, yeah. something like that. Yeah, no, like a very good example is I was in a classroom the other day and in a public education setting, and someone said, oh, you're so smart, you guys kiss your brains, and all the kids were like, <laughs> and like touched their head. <laughs> and like the whole class did it, like wow. in unison. It's like a um, religion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was very interesting. Um, and I was like, whoa, like we place a lot of emphasis on this. Mm -hmm. um, it was just the most recent time that I saw something that – reminded me of like how much emphasis is put on it. Sure. Um, so I just want to get into like a uh, little discussion on its role as we usually see it from the perspective we take. Yeah. You and know? thinking just to sort of go back into history a little bit um, as, as I like to do on here mm -hmm. is bef way back when people were trying to understand what people were doing and they were thinking about the role of the body and, and behavior and the biological aspects of it, the brain wasn't always considered that important. And there were a lot of emotions that were tied to either the heart or the stomach. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and probably rightfully so in some ways. Uh -huh. And so it wasn't until or, uh, later on in more scientific approaches where they realized um, sort of what the brain did. Um, but then, um, or the fact that the brain was m maybe more relevant to certain experiences than other parts of the body, like um, emotions don't necessarily stem exclusively from the heart and motivation doesn't necessarily stem exclusively from the stomach, yeah. but these things are more related and uh, the brain is uh, a critical component of all of those as well. It's not just this like thing that sits inside your skull and happens to be where your eyes are located. Yeah, so that's uh, that's some of what... I guess my background and kind of readings that I want to mention kind of brought up is it's uh, you look at anything like our central nervous system, like everything's connected, everything's interconnected, right. and it plays a role, an important role, and could be like pulling all that stuff together, right? Absolutely. Um, but the important thing is that anything we look at in the brain uh, also has to be looked at in the context of everything else that's going on around it, right? Right. And, so, and I think... And we're not going to talk about this much here, but in, it also occurs in the context of the genes that are involved in the development of the brain at the beginning of the life of the organism and how those genes and those gene expressions are changed over the course of the life of the organism and um, all of the other chemical and electrical factors that play that come are experienced by the organism as they mm -hmm. are developing. So uh, injury that happens or drugs that are introduced and a lack of or sufficient nutrition, those all affect how our entire body works. And yeah. that includes the brain. Yeah. So there's, there's plenty of information that kind of verifies that um, all of this stuff is connected, uh, it's coordinating, right? Right. Uh, per se. Um, and really integrating the whole organism together. Yeah, absolutely. So. We may have mentioned this a little bit earlier on, but it's this idea of looking at the influence of the brain, I guess you could say, mm -hmm. as it is a part of the whole organism. Because what, you know, it went from the extreme of the brain's not important at all to the extreme of the brain is the only important thing to a more 
I want to, I want to use the word holistic, but I don't want to use it in like a mystical way, but yeah. in, in a more comprehensive approach where um, the brain is linked to the, the entire system of, of the biology of the organism. Yeah. So I think at least our view, um, if I can speak for you, is that it's improper to say that it's like the role, the role of the brain is kind of as initiator or controller of anything. Right. right? No, it's a totally integrated variable in the network <clears throat> of experiences. Yeah. So it's as important as everything else. Yeah. Um, and I think a way to kind of understand that um, is that I used to uh, be asked, like, could someone behave in uh, kind of like a vacuum or in a space situation? Mm -hmm. And I kind of think of the same thing with uh, uh, the brain. Like, if the brain was just there, and that's all it was. Right. Would it be able to do any of the things that we say that it does? And just kind of give it credit in a for jar. It. Yeah. Um, and it couldn't. And that's that simple little thought experiment makes me realize, like, without everything else around it, including the environment, the right. internal organism, right? Everything like, uh, it, it can't do what it does. Yeah. So. I, and I think about that sometimes cause it's fun to see those shows where there's like just an omnibus brain floating there and it like speaks somehow. But if there's nothing going into the brain, there's no auditory stimulation, there's no visual stimulation, there's no sensory stimulation and the brain isn't controlling any musculature whatsoever. It's not it's not doing anything. <laughs> like yeah. It would just be sitting there <laughs> totally in, not interacting with the world around it, except for whatever chemical it's floating in. And even that might not be having any meaningful effect on it. So, um, yeah, absolutely. You're, you're right. And it's funny. It, so it's actually kind of funny for me in seeing like science fiction shows, the depiction of this brain that's actually doing something, even though it's sitting by itself, yeah. not connected to anything. Yeah. And I think our views are a little different than the mainstream. Um, yeah. For me, they were very different when I first heard of them, right? Sure. Um, but as I kind of like approached it with an open yet skeptical, I think you can still be very skeptical of what we're talking about and still um, kind of consume and understand it. The point of view, at least for me, um, has been that there's there's been a shift largely, uh, especially in the world of science, um, to looking at things not so as like certain parts are important to right. like the whole thing is important. Yeah. How they um, integrate. Yeah. And that whole integrated system, um, I don't think is really carried on into the world of human behavior, psychology, the brain, et cetera. Um, so kind of challenge the listeners to think of those things in those ways. Yeah. Including the brain. I guess what we're ending on there then is that, and we'll, we'll always come back to this topic. I think we have a lot to discuss with respect to the role of the brain and elements of the brain, but, um, I think uh, what we're kind of ending on here is that the the brain is not does not explain behavior. It describes a portion of behavior in terms of what is going on at the biological level. If you were looking at someone playing piano, you could look at how the fingers move. That would show you like the skeletal movements and what kind of muscles are involved, and that's useful information. And you could also look at the muscles in the arm and how the tendons are connected to the fingers and like the arm placement and yeah. what allows you to be more efficient and all of that's useful and in the same way you could look at the brain and how it coordinates those efforts and how it is mm -hmm. coordinated to the eyes and the arms and the legs and the posture and all of that and that's going to tell you additional information but that doesn't explain how the piano playing happened it described part of the process yes perfect cool so let's bring that into the context of brain scans or fMRIs. Right. So now we want to <laughs> when we're thinking now we want to look at that part of the biological organism mm -hmm. but how do we get how do we get to that? Because we have this barrier to our brain. We have some hair up there, most of us, and everyone. <laughs> uh, there's some skin for the most part, usually. Uh, and then there's a skull. And all of these things represent this boundary that's kind of difficult to penetrate if you want to look at it. But even then, let's say we were to peel back all those layers, cut open the skull, mm -hmm. looking at the brain itself just throbbing inside of your skull isn't going to tell you a whole lot about what's going on. Right? Yeah. You can't like... It doesn't seem very practical. No, it doesn't. <laughs> and it seems very invasive. It'd probably be an unpleasant procedure to go through. So before there was the fMRI, and I didn't plan to go much in the history of that. I think as we cover more of these brain scan technologies, yeah. we'll get a little bit more in the history of those because I just want to talk about what the process of the, of the fMRI is. Um, but before that technology existed, there wasn't a lot of ways to understand how the brain worked. And going back really far, one of the first ways that people started realizing the importance of various aspects of the brain was tr primarily brain injury. Yeah. So you'd have people on a battlefield and someone gets an ax to the back of their head 
and it pierces the part of their brain that processes visual information called um, the occipital, occipital lobe. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and all of a sudden they wouldn't be able to see or process visual information, even though nothing happened to their eyes. Yeah. And so people, you know, they can look at that and go, whoa, there's something important going on with your vision in the back of your head. Yeah. And um, in that same way, and moving forward a little bit in time, they then looked at other types of brain injury and where there would be um, damage to the brain, often referred to as like a lesion, where there might be a cut or a bruise or some kind of damage, and look at how that affected behavior. So if there was a normal pattern of behavior to look at, and then there was some kind of damage that occurred to a specific part of the brain, and then a type of behavior changed, mm -hmm. then they would have to, you could then infer that, oh, this part of the brain must be important for that yeah. type of behavior in some way. But as we've learned, um, and this is probably part of a larger conversation later on, the brain is so interconnected yeah. <laughs> that if you damage one part of it, you're probably damaging millions of neurons, yeah. that um, tens of millions of neurons that are all doing different things. And so you might be damaging a whole system and not a particular response pattern um, or even a particular sense or anything like that. There's just yeah. there's a lot going on up there. So... Um, Brain lesions were not only the only way to do it, um, but they have actually continued to persist. There's um, People see some value in sort of deliberately making cuts to a brain. So yeah. in animal research, they might um, have a, an animal that they open its skull and they make a lesion somewhere. They, they break the neurons um, by literally cutting through them with a yeah. scalpel. <laughs> and, uh, and then they see how that affects or changes behavior. And this uh, is, is still done sometimes, not as often today, to examine some of these um, things. But most people aren't really willing to be participants in that. So mm -hmm. humans don't get as much of this treatment. Yeah. They can still be looked at in terms of uh, the damage that's done. And so one classical case to look at is the story of Phineas Gage. He was the guy who, he, in the 1800s, he was working on a railroad. and Got the rod. Yeah, yeah it went right through his, his face. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember that? I do. I don't remember what it was. I, I, I feel like there was either no damage at all okay, or there was a certain area that was hit. Yeah. It actually almost completely destroyed his prefrontal cortex. Okay. So it entered in on the left side of his face, about the cheek, right around the eye, came out through the top of his skull, uh -huh. and the rod was pretty big around. I'd say it was probably two or three inches in diameter mm -hmm. um, and took out the vast majority of his prefrontal cortex, especially the left side of it. Yeah. Um, so the, um, just for those who don't know, that's the front part of the brain, and people typically associate that part of the brain with like reasoning and higher order thinking and okay. planning, that sort of thing. Anyway, um, so that happened. And of course, everyone's like, oh, that guy's dead. And yeah. he sat up almost immediately afterward and started talking. They're yeah. like, oh my God, yeah. it's a zombie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so he, he ended up recovering from this. He was okay. But it did significantly affect um, the patterns of behavior that, uh, that he was engaging in. And they were very different from how he had been before. Okay. And so specifically... People reported that he was much more irritable. He would be, he would swear a lot. He was very impulsive, mm -hmm. and those sorts of things. Uh, he had a difficult time holding on to jobs, uh, but he did live for quite a while afterward. So it really showed, though, before there were any ways of really looking at the role of that part of the brain, um, when brain damage happened there, how much it could affect someone's behavior, yeah. and wouldn't necessarily kill them <laughs> too. <laughs> um, and actually. I hadn't planned to talk about this, but that reminds me of there were – have historically been some psychological treatments where they then remove the front portion of the brain or a yeah. small part of the front portion of the brain. Um, it's called ablation. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's crazy. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and it was specifically to try and manage behavior and it would – you know, it could incapacitate people to some extent. Um, but it was not particularly precise. Like mm -hmm. we know that we can cut this out and that's going to change behavior, but yeah. you couldn't plan exactly for what the outcome of that was going to be. So, okay. Moving on from that and thinking about this idea that we can, um, you could look up, we could open up the brain, we could look at it, we could get some idea of the structure of what it looks like. Um, and that you could cause damage to it, see how uh -huh. that affects it. In a similar way, I like to just draw some metaphors of like if you were to take an eyeball and just look at it, that kind of tells you about the shape of it, what the um, what the optical nerve looks like coming out the back, how yeah. much like what's inside of it, and that tells you a little bit about it, but it doesn't really explain vision. 
Yeah, right. And yeah. so the same way you could like sort of look at the brain and look at how it does things, but that doesn't really explain all the jobs of the brain just by being able to describe those. So instead, it's more useful to look at what is going on um, in the brain as particular behaviors are being observed. Mm-hmm. Okay. So as I mentioned, there are a lot of different ways of scanning the brain. There's at least 10. Yeah, and I think there, I think there's more. <laughs> that's a lot. There's a lot. Yeah. Um, and there are more that are more common now. And I think that we're really planning to only tackle a few of those. Um, at least I am. <laughs> that could yeah. change. Um, so today, as I mentioned, we're primarily going to focus on the fMRI. So do you remember what that stands for? Functional magnetic r- something imaging. Resonance. Resonance imaging. imaging. Yeah. yeah. And this was a improvement on the technology that existed that was just magnetic resonance imaging um, and functional. So it was just called an MRI. Uh, functional refers to the fact that it's, it's faster and it really is designed to record changes in brain activity okay. over as like things are introduced. Okay. So w- what is it? Or uh, I guess what is, what is your familiarity with the fMRI? Yeah. So I've actually, been in a machine so oh, you have yeah oh, i don't know that yeah i don't remember what it was some injury at some point and it was what, what part of your body was in it i like i just remember going down this big tube okay so your whole body maybe and it being very loud yeah i was little so i don't remember a lot from it that's okay um but i guess as a side note i, I guess what do we want to get into on like the what it looks like like can you describe it you do a little more research on this stuff um right? well it, it's pretty large it takes up um, at least the, the pictures I was looking at to prepare for this takes up, you know, a good portion of a room. It's, I, I think about as tall as a person, maybe a little shorter and very wide. Yeah. And it looks like a big white box, uh-huh. which is an off white box. And there's a hole in the middle, right in the middle. That's very, it's pretty narrow. It's, you know, you, most of the time you can only fit, you can maybe fit a whole person inside of it. You also might only be able to fit a portion of the person. And I'm yeah. not sure if there's different sized ones. And then there's like a, a bed sort of, and a person is they're laying down and they're inserted into this machine Mm -hmm. and then they have to lie there very still. Yes. And as I understand it, it's extremely loud, like obnoxiously loud. One of the, one of the things that I kind of came into like recent contact with is um, they were trying to figure out ways to kind of aid with technology to kind of help people in those situations, both Mm -hmm. because you have to stay still and because of the loudness. Right. Um, So I actually will work with a guy who, on the weekends goes out and installs some like aftermarket products that help with those sort of situations. Cool. Um, that I thought was, I guess, pretty cool because yeah. my understanding is that, you know, when you're asked to sit still for 15 or 20 minutes, especially when you're talking about a child, anyone with disabilities, those sort of things, like right. it actually becomes really hard to even use what technology they do have to try to look at the situation in the first place. Right. Exactly. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my understanding of, uh, what it looks like and, how it kind of works. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to go into the, um, like how the machine is built. Um, it's, it's pretty complicated. It uses, as it implies, a lot of magnets. Um, it also uses, I was a little surprised to find out an enormous amount of helium. It's actually, I believe it's one of the highest demand, um, consumers that market is one of the highest um, in demand for the use of helium in order to work. They did not know that. Yeah. And mm-hmm. uh, also, we are, our planet is rapidly running out of helium. Okay. So, you, as you mentioned, when you were in there, you just had to like be really, really still. Yeah. And you can't move. How long were you in there? Do you remember? I do not remember. Okay. So, it was so long ago. No, that's okay. I was just wondering. <laughs> I think it depends on the nature of the scan that they're doing, um, how long you're in there. Um, but they really, like, you really can't move at all. And the, the mm-hmm. reason is, is we'll get into what the image is capturing is that every image that it captures if it moves from one to the other because it's measuring change mm-hmm. it will re have it'll tr- it'll recalibrate the statistics based on the new overlay the image that it's getting okay. so where there was a level below the um, another level if it shifts then there's now a different set of um, neurons that were in the place of where the yeah. neurons used to be and so the image is capturing those those old neuron or those the new placement as if we're the old one, and that changes how the statistics understand what's going on. Can humans even say that still? <laughs> I mean, um, yes, they can. Yeah. Um, 
However, as you mentioned, it's really difficult if you're doing it with animals or with people with disabilities or with young kids. Yeah. It's really difficult to get them to stay, stay, uh, stay still long enough. So I guess it's important to really try and start to break down in the fMRI. And the reason I wanted to do this is because it doesn't, it, it doesn't directly measure brain activity. Yeah. My understanding is that it's blood movement, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, primarily. Um, and so what it's really looking for is it's measuring oxygen. Yeah. Okay. And so the premise is, is this. Um, there is some research to indicate, and it's a pretty good research, like mm -hmm. this, is, this is well accepted um, scientific fact at this point, that when neurons are actively firing, they have to consume more or they use more blood. There's more mm -hmm. blood in the area. Okay. So if there's more blood in that area, there should be a higher amount of oxygenated blood as opposed to deoxygenated yeah. blood. So if there is, um, if so, there's a few steps that you have to go. Yeah. If there's neuron activity, then there should be more blood, which means there should be more oxygen. Mm -hmm. Which means that if you detect a higher amount of oxygen, that means there should be more blood. Which means that should mean that there's more activity mm -hmm. in that region of the brain. So you can see that you're taking a few steps away from. What's actually occurring. Right? Exactly. Or what you're trying to measure. Right. And yeah. I mean, it's it's near impossible to get a really accurate representation of what's going on in the brain. So this is one of the most thorough um, ways of looking at it. But that being said, it is only measuring the oxygen levels that are present in the brain. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Not to mention it's removed the natural event that we're even trying to look at, right? Right. And I think... Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. And I, uh, near the end of this, I want to have, to have a conversation about the the context in which brain activity occurs and how relevant that is. Okay. That even when you, when it, actually, it's really appropriate that we started with this. When you remove the brain from its normal surroundings um, and you put it in this little box, yeah, <laughs> it's devoid of a lot of the normal features that are going on. So, but we'll come back to that. Okay, so it's important to know that at no point is your brain not doing something. Yeah. As long as you are alive, your brain and your body are working together, mm -hmm. um, which is it's almost the definition of life at that point. Although, of course, there are organisms that don't have brains. But so that that kind of calls for a need for a baseline, right? As we talk about in our field. Yeah, exactly right. So, so where are things currently at? Precisely. So that we can talk about change in relation to where they were before. You got it. Right. Yeah, that's exactly cool. right. Um, <clears throat> So I guess in this case, to be more clear, like it would be measuring, right, the amount of blood flow and oxygen in that area prior to yeah. whatever happened. Right. So we're looking at, that's, that's our, I guess, our description of baseline, right? Exactly okay. right. So that means that someone has to go into this machine, they have to lie perfectly still, and for a while, it's got to calibrate and calculate what are their baseline levels of brain activity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where is the, um, oxygen and blood already being diverted while they're laying on the table? So that way, once they see where that level is at consistently, then they can just wipe that out as noise. Yeah. And then every anything that changes after that will be will represent um, the uh, a change in the brain relative to whatever change they provided for that person. Okay. okay? So it's some sort of stimulation or task or exactly something right. Like that. Yeah. So once they're in there and they've got their baseline measure, that's when they're going to try and introduce something. Or the, the the researcher or the psychologist or investigator, mm -hmm. neurologist, I don't know, it is list yeah. professions now, <laughs> just listing people. Uh, they're all standing in a room around you. Yeah. Um, actually, I think they're usually in, in another room. They're speaking to you for a microphone. But anyway, yes, yes. Um, they, uh, they're going to ask you to do something. They might say, like, I want you to remember the last time you did this, or I want you to solve this problem. Or they might be looking at any number of things where they're going to try to look at how does the brain activity change when I've presented them with this task? Yeah. And now this is, I mean, in a way, this is almost the bread and butter of like cognitive neuroscience. Yeah. Right? They, <laughs> yeah. they, you they just use, described like all the classes I took in Endeavor. Yeah. Like, <laughs> they use, um, <laughs> so these cognitive tasks are done, uh, are measured when you're looking at these cognitive brain science in this kind of, this kind of context where they're yeah. going to try and look at that. Okay. Okay. So just to take a step back. Yeah. Um, we've taken a person, we've mm -hmm. stuck them in this giant metal tube. Mm -hmm. um, it's extremely loud mm -hmm. and they can't move. Mm -hmm. And we're, we have to measure what's going on in their brain. And um, we are going to present them with some task. But yeah. what is this machine actually doing? 
I mean, it's not taking pictures, not literal pictures. Yeah. It's not like a photograph. So I would assume the magnets come into play. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're actually detecting the polar. That's, that's why it's so loud. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The detector, they're detecting the polarized version of the oxygen that exists in the blood in particular parts of your brain. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's not even that simple because there's a lot going on in the brain and there's a lot going on in different places. Mm -hmm. So the, what you see on the screen when it shows a picture of the brain is not actually a picture of the brain itself. What it is, is a computer software's statistical representation of the activity that's going on. Okay. And that breaks down into a few pieces. Okay. Graphically, this three-dimensional block that it's looking at is called a voxel. Okay. Okay. And you only need to know that because it's in relation to a pixel, which hopefully our listeners are familiar with a pixel, yeah. uh, refers to basically a section of an image. Mm -hmm. You're looking at a two-dimensional image or a picture of something. If you were to break that down small enough, you will get to one block of color or mm -hmm. line, and that is a pixel. Okay. So it's the smallest part of the image. So how does a pixel relate to a voxel? Well, a voxel is basically a 3D layered version of an image that um, it indicates like a section of of brain material. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, what happens is there's about a million neurons in a voxel. <laughs> yeah. That's insane. <laughs> That's a lot. And <laughs> tens of millions oh, of synapses inside that voxel. Okay. okay. And that voxel gets converted into a two-dimensional pixel. Yeah. So this 3D little block of space – they're looking at of these millions of neurons. Tens of millions of synapses. Tens of millions of synapses. In one pixel. In one pixel. And in a single picture, you have between anywhere from about 32,768 pixels all the way up to, at least the numbers I saw, and this could be more because I don't know how, how recent if this has changed, but mm -hmm. up all the way up to 49,152 pixels in a single picture. So... I mean, extrapolate that number. You've got a million neurons, and those are happening almost 50,000 times in a given picture. Okay. But for every pixel, the computer has to decide whether or not the activity in that pixel is significant enough that it should be recorded as a change, mm -hmm. right? So as I said, the brain's already moving. So it's got this baseline level. So it has to detect, okay, there was a change in this baseline level, but was it significant enough to count as a change okay. where there was actual activity? And that's averaging a million neurons. Yeah. So you have like, <laughs> if if there was activity, but it was only like 25,000 of those neurons, it okay. might register as no activity whatsoever for that pixel. It's also going to compare it to the pixels that are nearby in order to look at like, okay, there wasn't as much activity registered in this one, but in every other single surrounding pixel there was. So then this might then be more likely to be counted as an active uh, pixel. <laughs> okay. It's okay. a lot of assumptions. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot. Yeah. So like I said, you've now removed from, it's not even the activity of a single neuron, it's the activity of a million neurons yeah. that are being averaged compared to the surrounding neurons yeah. to determine whether or not the average was enough of a change from baseline to be detected. And then to be fair, it does calibrate that how much activity is seen there on sort of a color scale. Yeah. So the, and that's what people usually see, right? The color scale. Exactly that's right. That's what uh, I think most of us could relate to yeah and it tends to um be that the more sort of red shifted colors indicate a higher level activity whereas blue would indicate a like low level activity and it so you will see these ranges and colors um in the image that you see where certain areas of the brain are going to appear to be more colorful but that area of the brain is actually an average of several minutes of millions and millions and millions of synapses yeah hundreds of millions at this point, yeah. billions actually, yeah. <laughs> uh, billions of synapses, um, that it's the, the software is sort of automatically um, deciding whether or not it should appear as mm -hmm. an active or inactive pixel. Mm -hmm. Okay. On top of that, there's about a two to four seconds that it takes for the computer to do this process. Yeah. So it's not an immediate image. And of course, they've taken this, this into consideration. If they present some task, they're not oh, going to sure. be like the yeah. immediate response that they see on the screen is not necessarily the – is not at all. The immediate response they're going to count as being quote-unquote brain activity. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, they'll, they'll, there is that gap in time that, mm -hmm. that happens. In addition to that, the – uh, it's doing this sort of averaging as it goes. So it's like every image that you see, like non-moving image, mm -hmm. is an average of 
the activity that is an average of the activity yeah. <laughs> in the brain. So you have like an average of an average. <laughs> and um, because then what ends up happening is if you ever see a picture on like a study that's of a brain, it is almost always, and I think it, as far as I really read, it is always, but I could, mm-hmm. be, I could have missed something. It's, it's almost always a whole bunch of people in that one picture. Okay. So it's an average of a whole bunch of people's average of a whole bunch of neurons average. Yeah. So it's an average of an average of an average. And again, it's not actually directly measuring brain activity. It's it's measuring a event that is correlated with yeah. high level of brain proxy, activity. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Which is assumed mm-hmm. to indicate that those neurons were active and responsible for the execution of the task at hand. Yeah. So that's something I didn't even talk about before is that – you might have a whole lot of uh, neurons that are engaged with something and they maybe change in relation to the task at hand, but they aren't centrally important. But you wouldn't know that mm-hmm. because you all you have is the fact that activity occurred. Yeah. And you assume that if there was a lot of blood there and therefore a lot of oxygen, that um, that would indicate that there was a particular region that was more active than another. But again, it's an average of an average of an yeah. average yeah. Um, of a whole bunch of things. So, so what other issues do we get into when we talk about this? Well, there's a few. As I mentioned, these software programs that are used to run the fMRI machine, Mm -hmm. they come pre-installed with statistical packages that automatically will run the numbers on these to determine whether or not um, the activity should be counted as legitimate brain activity. Yeah. Right? And so um, probably uh, many people have heard of this, but years ago ago, they tried this um, just to demonstrate how these problems can arise at the statistical level, what do they do? Yeah. You know the story? Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. Say it again. Oh, yeah. I, I was just saying that years ago, they uh, really wanted to show how if you're not careful with your statistics, that you could get a lot of false positives in your data. And so they did this with a fish. Yes. Yes. The salmon. Yeah. Yes. My good friend Joe sent this along. Yeah. Uh, when I was reading into... I don't know what I was reading to. Something specifically. Okay. Do with brain activity. Sure. And he's like, have you seen this thing on the fish? Yeah. They found brain activity. Yeah. But there's a little hook in it, right? Uh, yeah. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> that was really not meant. Yeah. Uh, but the fish was dead. Right. And there was brain activity. Yep. <laughs> and what that was is it wasn't that there was lingering brain activity in the dead fish. The fish was quite dead. Yeah. It was the statistical noise that can occur um, from these machines. Mm-hmm. Now, at the time that – that was years ago now. And at the time that that was published, some people went through and looked at some data. And some of the numbers that I found were that as many as 25 to even 40% of studies with fMRIs were using that, that uncorrected statistical method and then reporting on those data in their peer-reviewed journals. Yes, and I so, also found that as well. Yeah, I mean, and that is hundreds of articles that were published with, with those data. And so it creates – a little bit of distrust, I think, in what happened. Now, as that was discovered, researchers got a lot better about that. And only two years later, that number had decreased to about 10%. But nice. I even heard... Cool. Yeah, right, yeah. So there was... So it was nice to see those things actually like change. Exactly right. Then I actually heard of some new research that came out, I believe it was just last year, that there were some other ways of manipulating the statistics, and not deliberately. Mm-hmm. Like they really are trying to find the, the best information, um, where... If you're not careful, you can still get a lot of false positives and that there, this is still a, a thing that's happening um, and not because they're not trying to correct the software, although some people don't know that, that you need to still, yeah. um, but just that you, it doesn't mean that there's necessarily the exact right type of statistics you need to use to calibrate the machine every time, you know, for every situation, right? So there's, people are still learning sort of how to calibrate it yeah. to get the, the most accurate results. So, man, that's a lot, right? Yeah. We're talking about you've, you've got to have a computer that's automatically running stats. You've got to calibrate those stats to make sure they're accurate, but you have nothing to compare them to uh-huh. for accuracy yeah. except to look for false positives as much as possible. But this also brings in what I was talking about at the very beginning on like our culture and how kind of brain-centric or um, reliant we are on – or just how into we are uh, as a consumer of all these products, tools, all the talk around this sort of stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so the effects on consumers, like what's that like? Yeah, that's an important point. And there was actually some research done. This is kind of interesting. This actually makes me laugh a lot. Um, relatively re- recently, a couple of years ago maybe, um, that 
they took these, I want to say they were like articles or flyers. I believe they were articles. And it was sort of like a one page summary of this article. Yeah. And they found that if they took the same exact article and on one version of it had a picture of an MRI scan, wasn't Mm -hmm. even from the article. It was just an MRI scan. Okay. And the other one, they didn't, that they would tell, they would give people these articles and then they would ask them whether or not they believed that research or they thought it was like good research or something like that. I remember Mm -hmm. exactly what they asked them. But um, the overall take home was that people were much more likely to believe research that had a picture of a brain on it. Yeah. Regardless of whether that brain had anything to do with it. Yeah. And so um, it's become this marketing tool where if you slap a picture of a brain on it, people are automatically like, oh, I can relate to that. Like yeah. this this, uh, this means good things. The brain yeah. the brain is good. And if there's a brain on it, it must be good. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's, it's a little bit tricky. And I think that you can – it falsely implies to people who don't read this research, who aren't new neurologists, mm-hmm. but are out there contacting this because people know how to exploit this phenomenon. Yeah, and uh, it it falsely represents the idea that the brain that first of all that this technology is more detailed and more accurate than it is. Yeah, because although it's one of the best technologies we have for looking at brain activity, it's still got a long way to go. Yeah, and it's not showing you a picture of what someone's thinking. Like a, a brain scan can't, uh, an fMRI can't do that. It can show you where the activity generally appears to be located on average Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for, for a particular task. And so I think it's important to bring it back to this conversation we had about like what is the brain doing in an environment where it's very loud yeah. and your body is stationary versus what is the brain doing in a normal environment where you're going to have a lot of different types of ambient noise. You might hear traffic or you might hear um, you know, people talking in the background. And you can easily tune those things out. Um, and you're also going to have a lot of different types of lighting. Um, you're going to yeah. have a different level of like how sleepy you are. If yeah. you're standing, then you're also having to coordinate all the muscles that hold your body in that position. If you're talking, then you coordinate all the muscles that are related to uh, moving your jaw and your tongue and your throat and the oxygen that goes yeah, through yeah. your – like it's just it's a lot that's going yeah. on. And so how those things relate to brain activity, like that's a there's a lot of difference that are going on. Yeah. And when you put someone in, in the situation that's just so different from how they're normally behaving, mm-hmm. you know, at least conceptually, it seems like you're making, again, just a little bit more of a leap yeah. to is this representative enough – of how the brain actually works in this circumstance. You know what I mean? Yeah. Man, yeah. That's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think that's I think that's everything I had on the fMRI. I think, like I said, we'll, we'll probably want to go more in depth in terms of other, a little bit more of the history. If people want to know how the machine works, I, f- I felt like that wasn't as particularly relevant to this. I yeah. mostly wanted to talk about it's what well, it's you really can learn. It's really well documented out there too. It is, so. yeah. It's easy to find a lot of information on this. There are a couple, a couple other criticisms that I found of the of, of fMRIs, and there were one in particular was that most of these studies, even though they are of multiple people, um, they are often what's referred to as low power, which means that they did have a relatively low sample size for a group design. Okay. okay. So if you're doing research using a group design, you have to have enough people in it that you can do statistics that will actually show some kind of effect yeah and also not so many that the numbers can just show whatever you want Mm -hmm. so it's sort of a range but um most of these scans um or these studies they might have between 40 50 and 100 people um but that's often the range and they're not enough there's not enough people in there for them for the statistics to be as robust as if they had a larger end yeah okay yeah, and then so, the other one. Sorry to interrupt. Very good. Uh, the, la- the last one was well. <laughs> there's actually several criticisms, <laughs> but the last one I planned to talk about was that there's different types of inference because I mentioned like mm-hmm. a lot of what we're doing with these is you're you're sort of deriving conclusions from what you see. Yeah. And the one they talk about is a reverse in, uh, inference, and this is actually very much related to the episode we did on circular reasoning, which is that you infer that if brain activity is taking place, then that brain activity represents the phenomenon you're interested in. But how do you know that brain activity that yeah. is occurring actually represents? Uh, because it's occurring. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Are you sure? Are we allowed to do that? <laughs> no. But it's, it is this idea of affirming, you're, you're affirming your conclusion by doing like a post hoc. It's, 
after it's already occurred, then you're like, oh, that must be what that thinking yeah, is. Yeah, so yeah. now the spring activity, um, when your only evidence for it is the fact that it occurred in the first place. So it doesn't, again, not an explanation. And to treat it as an explanation is logical fallacy. Yeah. And doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> for real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's what they call forward inference, which is basically just to say that if it occurs, it like if it occurs and it occurs with this particular behavior, then they're related. And it's basically what it is. It's a correlation. It's a yeah. descriptive measure. So exactly. to say that if these two things co-occur, then there then there might be a relation. Yeah. Um, and so making too strong of a judgment between the co-occurrence of those two variables um, can also be a little bit dangerous. Yeah. Right? So, <laughs> so we, you more so, but we kind of hit this hard. Yeah. Right. Um, so what do we want to like leave people with? I guess. Um, I think like. We, there's it, there's value there, right? Yeah, and I feel like so this whole thing we were sort of tearing apart this idea, and I don't I didn't want to make it seem like we're just ragging on fMRIs like they're not useful. They totally are, and they're actually especially useful. We didn't talk about this at all. They're especially useful when you're doing things like imaging brain tumors mm -hmm. and like understanding um, various elements of biology because they fMRI doesn't have to be on the brain. It actually, can be on any part of the body. Yeah, um, but. It's commonly used for the brain, and I wanted to do it in this case with respect to um, brain scans and um, uh, brain activity um, as it relates to psychology. But yeah, there the fMRI is, and I think I did mention this. It's a it's one of the most precise tools that we have for this. Yeah, and again, um, it should be understood. I really just want to let people know, you know, how it works, what the components of it are, um, where it's. And, you know, some criticism, some general mm -hmm. ideas of like, just if you see a picture of a brain, don't believe necessarily that means that you're, you're looking at good yeah. research. And at the same time, um, that it, it is a technique that's one of the better ones and it's being evolved. It's getting yeah. better. Cool. I think it was a really good summary. Thanks. <laughs> you right. got anything else? Uh, that's all I've got for this episode. All right, cool. All right, then we will sign off there. Uh, we look forward to catching you next time. Yeah. Next time. <laughs> Sorry. I'm Ryan O. And I am Abraham. We're out. Thanks for listening to Why We Do What We Do. If you like what you heard and would like to support the show, please consider heading over to our Patreon account at patreon.com slash podcast. Every little bit helps, and we're continuously lining up perks and merch for our supporters. Contact us on any social media platform at podcast or email us at info at www.podcast.com. You can learn more about this episode and other episodes by going to www.podcast.com. There you will find links and detailed and shareable show notes. This episode of Why We Do What We Do was written and produced by Ryan O. and Abraham. Artwork and logo design by Andrew Pollock at nogdesigns.com. Video and production assistance from Tyler Bessier. And music courtesy of Justin Greenhouse. 